Pretty much 100% chance that you are working with JSON and having to put something that the server sends you on the screen, convert from JSON to Swift. My name is Donnie Wells, and today we're going to take a look at JSON parsing in Swift. Did you know that JSON actually stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and that all the objects in a JSON object are JavaScript objects? If you were to write JavaScript, then any dictionary or object that you build is going to be written using JSON. This is not the point of the video though, but I did want you to know that because it's just a kind of little fun fact in my opinion. Anyway, in this video, we are going to look at the Codable protocol. Codable is a protocol that allows us to take data and turn it into Swift models or to take Swift models and turn them into data. We can use JSON as our data container, but it could also be plist or something else. And I'm going to focus on JSON because that is by far the most common way to use Codable in Swift. And the principles in this video are mostly universal, whether you're using JSON or plist or something else. But I'm going to use JSON again as an example. Let's go ahead and start with our Codable exploration now. And then we'll look at how we can actually take what we do in Codable and apply that to JSON. So Codable is a union of two protocols, encodable and decodable. Each of these protocols indicate that we can do something with data and a Swift model. For example, encodable means that we can take a Swift model and transform instances of the model into data. For example, JSON data. Decodable works the other way around. It means that we can take data, like JSON data, and transform that into Swift models. If we only need either of these two functionalities, we can conform our objects to either encodable or decodable. If we need both, we can conform to codable, because codable, again, is a union of the two protocols. We can make enums, structs, classes, and pretty much anything that can conform to a protocol codable. Right? So it doesn't really matter whether we use structs or classes if we work with codable, as long as we conform to the protocol. A lot of built-in types in Swift are already codable, and you don't need to do anything to make them codable. For example, strings, integers, UUIDs, booleans, these are all types that can already be converted from data into instances of their type. Even dictionaries and array are codable, as long as the objects that they hold are codable themselves. For example, if we have an array of strings, that array is codable, because string is codable out of the box. If we have a dictionary that has keys for strings and values for strings as well, then we can actually also make that dictionary code codable, or rather it is codable out of the box. We don't have to do anything to make that happen. It's relatively easy to represent dictionaries and arrays in JSON. And in fact, they are super important because dictionaries are how JSON define, defines objects um, or dictionaries, right? So if you define a struct in JSON, it's going to be defined as a dictionary. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at some examples. If we have this uh, array that we have on screen, it looks a lot like an array literal in Swift. And that's because arrays in Swift and arrays in JSON are defined the exact same way. We have a bracket, we have our values for the array, in this case, two strings, and then we close the array and that's it. That's how we define the entire array. Dictionary looks very similar to Swift, but it's slightly different, right? So instead of opening the dictionary with a, a bracket, we open it with a curly brace. And then we have our keys and values, and then we close it with a curly brace, right? Something interesting to notice about the dictionary you're looking at right now is that this dictionary uses strings as its keys. We can represent those in Swift and are codable, so that's great. However, this dictionary has a string, an integer, and a Boolean as its key, uh, as its values. Right, so that means that if we try to represent this in Swift, we kind of have to write this as a dictionary of string and any. However, any isn't codable. So we couldn't make that dictionary codable automatically, and it would be pretty painful to try and work around that somehow. However, as I mentioned, JSON also uses dictionaries to represent our structs. And because all of the values in this dictionary are codable, we can actually decode this uh, JSON dictionary into a struct or class, really, uh, whatever we want, as long as it's codable. I'm gonna use a struct though. So given the JSON that you're seeing, we can define the following struct to match that JSON. All right here we have a struct example struct, it's decodable. It has three properties, hello, sum, int, and bool, and the types for these properties match the types of the values that we had in our JSON. 
If I were to also want to encode this object into data and send it over to server, I would also make this struct encodable, but it's decodable only for now because we're only worried about decoding. The property names that I have on my struct should all match the JSON exactly, letter for letter, including casing. If anything is off, our decoding won't work. And we'll look at how to work around that in a later video. All the data types of the properties must also match the type of the value in JSON. Right? So in this case, we have the string, we have the integer, we have the Boolean. They all match up perfectly, and that's very important. Once we've done all that, Swift will automatically generate the code that's needed to take the data that we download from a server and to transform it to an instance of our model using the information that we give it by defining our properties and the types of the properties and making our object decodable. No extra work needed, so that's quite neat. If we have a more complicated JSON object like this one, where we have a status property, which is active in this case, and then we have an object's value, which holds an array of dictionaries. Right? And this dictionary also is of mixed type, so we know that we're going to be decoding this into a struct. If we were to build a um, struct for this, then we have to read this JSON like I just did, and then we can define our model like this. Right? We have this response object, and it has a status, which is a string, which is going to be uh, what the value of that status in JSON is, and we have let objects, which is an array of a product object. Product itself is decodable, right? We see that down uh, below the response, and we see that it has the ID, name, and available properties, which all match nicely to what we saw in the JSON. And Swift can actually decode this response because all of its members are decodable. If product wasn't decodable, then the compiler will tell us that the response can't be codable because one of its members isn't codable. Now, if you're struggling to read the JSON and if you are not sure how you would best define your own structs or classes that are codable, then what you could do is actually just paste the JSON to ChatGPT and ask it, can you please define the decodable model uh, that matches with this JSON for me? And when I did that earlier to see if that would actually work, here's what it came up with. The names, I do not like them. My object, my response, ugh, ugly. But um, the data types and the property names are there. So all you would have to do is rename the struct. So that's quite neat. Uh, this is all very structured as well. So ChatGPT should do a pretty reliable job of helping you out here. Quite cool. We could actually improve the models though, because uh, we currently have a status string, right, of active. That kind of implies that we might have a couple of fixed states, like for example, active or inactive. So what we could do is update the response object like this, where I have an enum response status, which has a raw type of string and it's decodable. So that means that this enum can now be decoded from JSON as well. And our response struct now uses the response status as its status. And this all works again because enum is decodable, which makes all of the members of response decodable. So if we know that we're going to get one of two values from JSON, in this case active or inactive, we can make that into an enum and represent that as a state, which is really, really nice. So now that you've seen some examples of how you can define the codable structs, let's see how we can convert data into these structs, okay? So we can define some dummy data like this. We have a, a JSON object that we define. It's the exact object that you saw before. And we can call data using UTF-8 on a string to convert that string into data. So that's what we do right here. And normally you would get this data from your server and you wouldn't write you know, a manual JSON string, but for testing purposes, it's quite nice that you can do it this way. And to decode this data that we just created into instances of our struct, we make an instance of an object called JSON decoder. Right, and we make that instance and then we call decode on that decoder. And we pass two arguments to that function. One is the data type that we want to decode into. So in this case, that's going to be response.self. And we pass it the data that it should use as the source, in this case, example data. The, this argument that we pass, uh, first, the, the type that we want to decode into is passed by the, passing the type name followed by self. So in this case, that was response.self. But if it would be an array, for example, it would look a little bit like this, where we would say an array of product dot self. Okay, so it's always the, the full type followed by dot self, never an array of product dot self, right? So not bracket product dot self, closing bracket, 
but always bracket product, closing bracket, dot self. Same for dictionaries, bracket key, colon value, close to bracket, dot self. Okay, so that's always how it's done uh, and how you would pass the type of an object around in Swift anyway. Now, if something goes wrong, uh, you could actually print the error like we did in the code snippet you saw before. And these kinds of errors can help debugging a lot. They're not particularly useful for your users. Uh, so if they occur in production, you might want to show your user something more useful. Um, but during, during development, it's very useful to print these errors. And you can see something like uh, what I'm showing on screen right now. There's a lot of text here, but essentially this error tells us that the decoder could not find a key named missing object um, in the JSON, right? So we have a, a property missing object in a struct, and that means that JSON decoder is going to look for a matching key in the JSON dictionary that we gave it, can't find it, throws an error. Okay, so that's how JSON decoder tells us that it tried to decode data into a given struct, but it couldn't do that because something was wrong. Carefully reading these errors is a really good idea because like you just saw, there's a lot of data in there and a lot of it's not particularly useful, but JSON decoder always puts all the information of what's wrong inside of the error object, right? So there's going to be something useful in there, I promise you. If you notice that the JSON decoder is looking for uh, an object that you believe should be there or property that you believe should be there, they can't find it, you probably have a typo. So really carefully pay attention to that. And if it's looking for something that you know you typed correctly and it's just not there in the JSON, that might mean that it should be optional. Right? And optionals are codable, so you can perfectly fine say that this string should be an optional, for example. That's decoding data in a nutshell. Let's take a look at encoding data next and how it's pretty much the same thing as decoding except the other way around. When you encode a model, uh, the result is that you have some data, right? It's going to be a data object, Swift data object, not Swift data, the framework, but Swift, the language data. Uh, and you can send that data somewhere, for example, a server, or you could store it on a file system. When we define a struct, uh, that struct can be encoded and decoded um, by making it codable, right? You already saw decodable, now we're making our product codable because we want to work both ways. If we want to encode an instance of product, we can make an instance of product first, like we do normally, and then we can say let encoder equals a JSON encoder, make data by calling try encoder.encode and give it our instance. The JSON encoder will know exactly what to do and encode the object as needed. When this code runs and you print the result, um, you would print something like the string 44 bytes. That might be surprising um, because you might expect to see JSON in the console, but you're printing data, right? You're printing encoded or rather converted to data bytes rather than a JSON string. So if you were to want to check whether the data that you ended up with is the correct kind of data, you would have to convert your data back into a string. For example, by saying if let JSON string equals string, pass it data, pass it UTF-8 encoding, and then you can print the JSON string. And you would get something like this, right? All the keys and values after each other on a single line. This is hard to read. And sometimes you might want to print something a little bit different. Uh, for example, you might want to print it in the same way that all the code snippets from earlier in the video were printed, which is a lot easier to read. If that's something you want to do, you can set the output formatting on your JSON encoder. Uh, and it looks a little bit like this, right? So in this case, I'm setting output formatting to pretty printed. And pretty printed means that it's going to be printed in a very human readable format, which looks a little bit like this, right? That's a lot easier to read, a lot easier on the eyes. If you're sending this over to a server, I would recommend to not use this because every new line, every tab, it's, it's all extra data and it's really not needed for a server because machines do not care about new lines typically. Some servers, however, might have specific requirements about the way that your keys in the JSON are sorted. For example, some servers will uh, hash the JSON you send and compare that to JSON that was sent before. Now, if your keys are not sorted, then two identical JSON objects might actually appear as different to the server because the order of the keys is different, which means that the resulting hash of that JSON file would also be different. Pretty technical stuff. Um, the key takeaway is sometimes you might have to sort your keys because the server wants you to. You can do this by setting the output formatting on your encoder to be sorted keys. 
and then make sure that all the keys in your JSON are sorted alphabetically. So what if you wanted to combine sorted and pretty prints? Well, we can do that. We can actually sort our keys and pretty print our JSON by passing output formatting an array of the options that we want. Quite neat, quite straightforward, and it makes it so that we have full control over the output. So in this video, you've learned about JSON. You've learned a little bit about what it is, how you can read it as a human, and how ChatGPT can help you read it even better. Uh, you saw how you can define a decodable model, and you saw how you can use that to have a JSON decoder decode data into instances of your model. I also told you that Codable is a union of the encodable and decodable protocol, and that you can pick whichever protocol that you need for the things that you want to do with your data. After that, I showed you some examples of encoding and decoding objects that match your JSON structure. And I will be uploading some more videos where you learn about more complex codable use cases, because in this video, we covered the basics, we covered the essentials, and we covered the cases that are relatively simple. And there are a lot of complicated things that you can do with Codable, but they simply wouldn't fit in a single video. So there'll be follow-up videos on that. Thank you for watching this one. If you are not subscribed uh, to this channel, go ahead and do that right now. Make sure to hit that like button, do all the things that make the algorithm happy. And a happy algorithm means a happy Donnie in the end. So thank you for watching and see you in the next one.